Chapter Six of Conan Beyond the Black River by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six Red Axes of the Border. Conan did not plunge deeply into the forest. A few hundred yards from the river, he altered his slanting course and ran parallel with it. Balthus recognized a grim determination not to be hunted away from the river which they must cross if they were to warn the men in the fort. Behind them rose more loudly the yells of the forest men. Balthus believed the picks had reached the glade where the bodies of the slain men lay. Then further yells seemed to indicate that the savages were streaming into the woods in pursuit. They had left a trail any picked could follow. Conan increased his speed, and Balthus grimly set his teeth and kept on his heels, though he felt he might collapse any time. It seemed centuries since he had eaten last. He kept on going more by an effort of will than anything else. His blood was pounding so furiously in his eardrums that he was not aware when the yells died out behind them. Conan halted suddenly. Balthus leaned against a tree and panted. They've quit, grunted the Cimmerian, scowling. Sneaking up on us, gasped Balthus. Conan shook his head. A short chase like this, they'd yell every step of the way. No, they've gone back. I thought I heard somebody yelling behind them a few seconds before the noise began to get dimmer. They've been recalled, and that's good for us, but damned bad for the men in the fort. It means the warriors are being summoned out of the woods for the attack. These men we ran into were warriors from a tribe down the river. They were undoubtedly headed for Guawila to join in the assault on the fort. Damn it! We're farther away than ever now. We've got to get across the river. Turning east, he hurried through the thickets with no attempt at concealment. Balthus followed him for the first time feeling the sting of lacerations on his breast and shoulder where the pick's savage teeth had scored him. He was pushing through the thick bushes that fringed the bank when Conan pulled him back. Then he heard a rhythmic splashing, and peering through the leaves saw a dugout canoe coming up the river, its single occupant paddling hard against the current. He was a strongly built Pict with a white heron feather thrust in a copper band that confined his square-cut mane. "'That's a Guawila man,' muttered Conan. "'Emissary from Zogar. White plume shows that. He's carried a peace talk to the tribes down the river, and now he's trying to get back and take a hand in the slaughter.' The lone ambassador was now almost even with their hiding place, and suddenly Balthus almost jumped out of his skin. At his very ear had sounded the harsh gutturals of a Pict. Then he realized that Conan had called to the paddler in his own tongue. The man started, scanned the bushes and called back something, then cast a startled glance across the river, bent low, and sent the canoe scooting in toward the western bank. Not understanding, Balthus saw Conan take from his hand the bow he had picked up in the glade and notch an arrow. The Pict had run his canoe in close to the shore, and, staring up into the bushes, called out something. His answer came in the twang of the bowstring, the streaking flight of the arrow that sank to the feathers in his broad breast. With a choking gasp he slumped sidewise and rolled into the shallow water. In an instant Conan was down the bank and wading into the water to grasp the drifting canoe. Balthus stumbled after him and somewhat dazedly crawled into the canoe. Conan scrambled in, seized the paddle, and sent the craft shooting toward the eastern shore. Balthus noted with envious admiration the play of the great muscles beneath the sunburnt skin. The Cimmerian seemed an iron man who never knew fatigue. "'What did you say to the Pict?' asked Balthus. "'Told him to pull into shore. Said there was a white forest runner on the bank who was trying to get a shot at him. That doesn't seem fair, Balthus objected. He thought a friend was speaking to him. You mimicked a Pict perfectly. We needed his boat, grunted Conan, not pausing in his exertions. Only way to lure him to the bank. 
which is worse, to betray a Pict who'd enjoy skinning us both alive, or betray the men across the river whose lives depend on our getting over? Balthus mulled over this delicate ethical question for a moment, then shrugged his shoulder and asked, How far are we from the fort? Conan pointed to a creek which flowed into Black River from the east, a few hundred yards below them. That's South Creek. It's ten miles from its mouth to the fort. It's the southern boundary of Kananjahara. Marshes miles wide south of it. No danger of a raid from across them. Nine miles above the fort, North Creek forms the other boundary. Marshes beyond that, too. That's why an attack must come from the west, across Black River. Kalanjahara's just like a spear, with a point nineteen miles wide, thrust into the Pictish wilderness. Why don't we keep to the canoe and make the trip by water? Because, considering the current we've got to brace, and the bends in the river, we can go faster afoot. Besides, remember, Guawila is south of the fort. If the Picts are crossing the river, we'd run right into them. Dusk was gathering as they stepped upon the eastern bank. Without pause, Conan pushed on northward, at a pace that made Balthus' sturdy legs ache. Valanus wanted a fort built at the mouths of North and South Creeks, grunted the Cimmerian. Then the river could be patrolled constantly, but the government wouldn't do it. Soft-bellied fools! sitting on velvet cushions with naked girls offering them iced wine on their knees. I know the breed. They can't see any farther than their palace wall. Diplomacy? Hell! They'd fight picks with theories of territorial expansion. Milanus and men like him have to obey the orders of a set of damned fools. They'll never grab any more Pictish land, any more than they'll ever rebuild Venarium. The time may come when they'll see the barbarians swarming over the walls of the eastern cities. A week before, Balthus would have laughed at any such preposterous suggestion. Now he made no reply. He had seen the unconquerable ferocity of the men who dwelt beyond the frontiers. He shivered, casting glances at the sullen river, just visible through the bushes at the arches of the trees which crowded close to its banks. He kept remembering that the Picts might have crossed the river and be lying in ambush between them and the fort. It was fast growing dark. A slight sound ahead of them jumped his heart into his throat, and Conan's sword gleamed in the air. He lowered it when a dog, a great, gaunt, scarred beast, slunk out of the bushes and stood staring at them. That dog belonged to a settler who tried to build his cabin on the bank of the river a few miles south of the fort, grunted Conan. The Picts slipped over and killed him, of course, and burned his cabin. We found him dead among the embers, and the dog lying senseless among three Picts he'd killed. He was almost cut to pieces. We took him to the fort and dressed his wounds, but after he recovered he took to the woods and turned wild. What now, Slasher? Are you hunting the men who killed your master? The massive head swung from side to side, and the eyes glowed greenly. He did not growl or bark. Silently as a phantom, he slid in between them. Let him come, muttered Conan. He can smell the devils before we can see them. Balthus smiled and laid his hand caressingly on the dog's head. The lips involuntarily writhed back to display the gleaming fangs. Then the great beast bent his head sheepishly, and his tail moved with jerky uncertainty, as if the owner had almost forgotten the emotions of friendliness. Baltus mentally compared the great gaunt hard body with the fat sleek hounds tumbling vociferously over one another in his father's kennel yard. He sighed. The frontier was no less hard for beasts than for men. This dog had almost forgotten the meaning of kindness and friendliness. Slasher glided ahead, and Conan let him take the lead. The last tinge of dusk faded into stark darkness. 
the miles fell away under their steady feet. Slasher seemed voiceless. Suddenly he halted, tense, ears lifted. An instant later the men heard it. A demoniac yelling up the river ahead of them, faint as a whisper. Conan swore like a madman. They've attacked the fort. We're too late. Come on. He increased his pace, trusting to the dog to smell out ambushes ahead. In a flood of tense excitement, Balthus forgot his hunger and weariness. The yells grew louder as they advanced, and above the devilish screaming they could hear the deep shouts of the soldiers. Just as Balthus began to fear they would run into the savages who seemed to be howling just ahead of them, Conan swung away from the river in a wide semicircle that carried them to a low rise from which they could look over the forest. They saw the fort, lighted with torches thrust over the parapet on long poles. These cast a flickering, uncertain light over the clearing, and in that light they saw throngs of naked, painted figures along the fringe of the clearing. The river swarmed with canoes. The Picts had the fort completely surrounded. An incessant hail of arrows rained against the stockade from the woods and the river. The deep twanging of the bowstrings rose above the howling. Yelling like wolves, several hundred naked warriors, with axes in their hands, ran from under the trees and raced toward the eastern gate. They were within a hundred and fifty yards of their objective, when a withering blast of arrows from the wall littered the ground with corpses, and sent the survivors fleeing back to the trees. The men in the canoes rushed their boats toward the river wall and were met by another shower of cloth-yard shafts and a volley from the small ballistas mounted on towers on that side of the stockade. Stones and logs whirled through the air and splintered and sank half a dozen canoes, killing their occupants, and the other boats drew back out of range. A deep roar of triumph rose from the walls of the fort, answered by bestial howling from all quarters. "'Shall we try to break through?' asked Balthus, trembling with eagerness. Conan shook his head. He stood with his arms folded, his head slightly bent, a somber and brooding figure. The fort's doomed. The Picts are blood-mad and won't stop until they're all killed, and there are too many of them for the men in the fort to kill. We couldn't break through, and if we did, we could do nothing but die with Avalanus. There's nothing we can do but save our own hides, then? Yes, we've got to warn the settlers. Do you know why the Picts are not trying to burn the fort with fire arrows? Because they don't want a flame that might warn the people to the east. They plan to stamp out the fort, and then sweep east before anyone knows of its fall. They may cross Thunder River and take Velitrium before the people know what's happening. At least they'll destroy every living thing between the fort and Thunder River. We failed to warn the fort, and I see now it would have done no good if we had succeeded. The fort's too poorly manned. A few more charges and the Picts will be over the walls and breaking down the gates. But we can start the settlers toward Velitrium. Come on. We're outside the circle the Picts have thrown around the fort. We'll keep clear of it. They swung out in a wide arc, hearing the rising and falling of the volume of the yells, marking each charge and repulse. The men in the fort were holding their own, but the shrieks of the Picts did not diminish in savagery. They vibrated with a timbre that held assurance of ultimate victory. Before Balthus realized they were close to it, they broke into the road leading east. "'Now run!' grunted Conan. Balthus set his teeth. It was nineteen miles to Velitrium, a good five to Scalp Creek, beyond which began the settlements. It seemed to the Aquilonian that they had been fighting and running for centuries, but the nervous excitement that rioted through his blood stimulated him to Herculean efforts. Slasher ran ahead of them, his head to the ground, snarling low, the first sound they had heard from him. "'Picks ahead of us!' snarled Conan, dropping to one knee and scanning the ground in the starlight. He shook his head, baffled. I can't tell how many. 
probably only a small party, some that couldn't wait to take the fort. They've gone ahead to butcher the settlers in their beds. Come on! Ahead of them, presently, they saw a small blaze through the trees, and heard a wild and ferocious chanting. The trail bent there, and, leaving it, they cut across the bend through the thickets. A few moments later they were looking on a hideous sight. An oxwain stood in the road, piled with meager household furnishings. It was burning. The oxen lay near with their throats cut. A man and a woman lay in the road, stripped and mutilated. Five picks were dancing about them with fantastic leaps and bounds, waving bloody axes. One of them brandished the woman's red-smeared gown. At the sight a red haze swam before Balthus. Lifting his bow, he lined the prancing figure black against the fire and loosed. The slayer leaped convulsively and fell dead with the arrow through his heart. Then the two white men and the dog were upon the startled survivors. Conan was animated merely by his fighting spirit, and an old, old racial hate, but Balthus was afire with wrath. He met the first picked to oppose him with a ferocious swipe that split the painted skull, and sprang over his falling body to grapple with the others. But Conan had already killed one of the two he had chosen, and the leap of the Aquilonian was a second late. The warrior was down with a long sword through him, even as Balthus's axe was lifted. Turning toward the remaining Pict, Balthus saw Slasher rise from his victim, his great jaws dripping blood. Balthus said nothing as he looked down at the pitiful forms in the road beside the burning wain. Both were young, the woman little more than a girl. By some whim of chance the Picts had left her face unmarred, and even in the agonies of an awful death it was beautiful. But her soft young body had been hideously slashed with many knives. A mist clouded Balthus's eyes, and he swallowed chokingly. The tragedy momentarily overcame him. He felt like falling upon the ground and weeping and biting the earth. "'Some young couple just hitting out on their own.' Conan was saying, as he wiped his sword unemotionally, on their way to the fort when the Picts met them. Maybe the boy was going to enter the service, maybe take up land on the river. Well, that's what will happen to every man, woman, and child this side of Thunder River if we don't get them into Velitrium in a hurry. Balthus's knees trembled as he followed Conan. But there was no hint of weakness in the long, easy stride of the Cimmerian. There was a kinship between him and the great gaunt brute that glided beside him. Slasher no longer growled with his head to the trail. The way was clear before them. The yelling on the river came faintly to them, but Balthus believed the fort was still holding. Conan halted suddenly with an oath. He showed Balthus a trail that led north from the road. It was an old trail, partly grown with new young growth, and this growth had recently been broken down. Balthus realized this fact more by feel than sight, though Conan seemed to see like a cat in the dark. The Cimmerian showed him where broad wagon tracks turned off the main trail, deeply indented in the forest mold. "'Settlers going to the licks after salt,' he grunted. They're at the edges of the marsh, about nine miles from here. Blast it! They'll be cut off and butchered to a man. Uh, listen, one man can warn the people on the road. Go ahead and wake them up and herd them into Belitrium. I'll go and get the men gathering the salt. They'll be camped by the licks. We won't come back to the road. We'll head straight through the woods. With no further comment, Conan turned off the trail and hurried down the dim path, and Balthus, after staring after him for a few moments, set out along the road. The dog had remained with him and glided softly at his heels. When Balthus had gone a few rods he heard the animal growl. Whirling, he glared back the way he had come, and was startled to see a vague, ghostly glow vanishing into the forest in the direction Conan had taken. Slasher rumbled deep in his throat. 
his hackles stiff and his eyes balls of green fire. Balthus remembered the grim apparition that had taken the head of the merchant Tiberius not far from that spot, and he hesitated. The thing must be following Conan, but the giant Cimmerian had repeatedly demonstrated his ability to take care of himself, and Balthus felt his duty lay toward the helpless settlers who slumbered in the path of the Red Hurricane. The horror of the fiery phantom was overshadowed by the horror of those limp, violated bodies beside the burning oxwain. He hurried down the road, crossed Scalp Creek, and came in sight of the first settler's cabin, a long, low structure of axe-hewn logs. In an instant he was pounding on the door. A sleepy voice inquired his pleasure. "'Get up! The picks are over the river!' That brought instant response. A low cry echoed his words, and then the door was thrown open by a woman in a scanty shift. Her hair hung over her bare shoulders in disorder. She held a candle in one hand and an axe in the other. Her face was colorless, her eyes wide with terror. "'Come in,' she begged. "'We'll hold the cabin.' "'No, we must make for Velitrium. The fort can't hold them back. It may have fallen already. Don't stop to dress. Get your children and come on.' "'But my man's gone with the others after salt,' she wailed, wringing her hands. Behind her peered three tousled youngsters, blinking and bewildered. "'Conan's gone after them. He'll fetch them through safe. We must hurry up the road to warn the other cabins.' Relief flooded her countenance. "'Mitra be thanked,' she cried. "'If the Cimmerians gone after them, they're safe, if mortal man can save them.' In a whirlwind of activity she snatched up the smallest child and herded the others through the door ahead of her. Balthus took the candle and ground it out under his heel. He listened an instant. No sound came up the dark road. "'Have you got a horse?' "'In the stable,' she groaned. "'Oh, hurry!' He pushed her aside as she fumbled with shaking hands at the bars. He led the horse out and lifted the children on its back, telling them to hold to its mane and to one another. They stared at him seriously, making no outcry. The woman took the horse's halter and set out up the road. She still gripped her axe, and Balthus knew that if cornered she would fight with the desperate courage of a she-panther. He held behind, listening. He was oppressed by the belief that the fort had been stormed and taken, that the dark-skinned hordes were already streaming up the road toward Velitrium, drunken on slaughter and mad for blood. They would come with the speed of starving wolves. Presently they saw another cabin looming ahead. The woman started to shriek a warning, but Balthus stopped her. He hurried to the door and knocked. A woman's voice answered him. He repeated his warning, and soon the cabin disgorged its occupants, an old woman, two young women, and four children. Like the other woman's husband, their men had gone to the salt licks the day before, unsuspecting of any danger. One of the young women seemed dazed, the other prone to hysteria. But the old woman, a stern old veteran of the frontier, quieted them harshly. She helped Balthus get out the two horses that were stabled in a pen behind the cabin, and put the children on them. Balthus urged that she herself mount with them, but she shook her head and made one of the younger women ride. "'She's with child,' grunted the old woman. "'I can walk, and fight, too, if it comes to that.' As they set out, one of the women said, "'A young couple passed along the road about dusk. We advised them to spend the night at our cabin, but they were anxious to make the fort tonight. Did—did—' did... "'They met the Picts,' answered Balthus briefly, and the woman sobbed in horror. They were scarcely out of sight of the cabin, when some distance behind them quavered a long, high-pitched yell. "'A wolf!' exclaimed one of the women. "'A painted wolf with an axe in his hand,' muttered Balthus. "'Go! Rouse the other settlers along the road, and take them with you. I'll scout along behind.' Without a word the old woman herded her charges ahead of her. As they faded into the darkness, Balthus could see the pale ovals that were the faces of the children twisted back over their shoulders to stare toward him. He remembered his own people on the Toran, and a moment's giddy sickness swam over him. 
With momentary weakness he groaned and sank down in the road. His muscular arm fell over Slasher's massive neck, and he felt the dog's warm, moist tongue touch his face. He lifted his head and grinned with a painful effort. "'Come on, boy,' he mumbled, rising. "'We've got work to do.' A red glow suddenly became evident through the trees. The picks had fired the last hut. He grinned. How Zogar Sag would froth if he knew his warriors had let their destructive natures get the better of them. The fire would warn the people farther up the road. They would be awake and alert when the fugitives reached them. But his face grew grim. The women were traveling slowly, on foot and on the overloaded horses. The swift-footed picks would run them down within a mile, unless— he took his position behind a tangle of fallen logs beside the trail. The road west of him was lighted by the burning cabin, and when the picks came he saw them first, black furtive figures etched against the distant glare. Drawing a shaft to the head, he loosed, and one of the figures crumpled. The rest melted into the woods on either side of the road. Slasher whimpered with a killing lust beside him. Suddenly a figure appeared on the fringe of the trail under the trees, and began gliding toward the fallen timbers. Balthus's bowstring twanged, and the picked yelped, staggered, and fell into the shadows with the arrow through his thigh. Slasher cleared the timbers with a bound and leaped into the bushes. They were violently shaken, and then the dog slunk back to Balthus's side, his jaws crimson. No more appeared in the trail. Balthus began to fear they were stealing past his position through the woods, and when he heard a faint sound to his left, he loosed blindly. He cursed as he heard the shaft splinter against a tree, but Slasher glided away as silently as a phantom, and presently Balthus heard a thrashing and a gurgling. Then Slasher came like a ghost through the bushes, snuggling his great crimson-stained head against Balthus's arm. Blood oozed from a gash in his shoulder, but the sounds in the wood had ceased forever. The men lurking on the edges of the road evidently sensed the fate of their companion, and decided that an open charge was preferable to being dragged down in the dark by a devil-beast they could neither see nor hear. Perhaps they realized that only one man lay behind the logs. They came with a sudden rush, breaking cover from both sides of the trail. Three dropped with arrows through them, and the remaining pair hesitated. One turned and ran back down the road, but the other lunged over the breastwork, his eyes and teeth gleaming in the dim light, his axe lifted. Balthus's foot slipped as he sprang up, but the slip saved his life. The descending axe shaved a lock of hair from his head, and the picked rolled down the logs from the force of his wasted blow. Before he could regain his feet, Slasher tore his throat out. Then followed a tense period of waiting, in which time Balthus wondered if the man who had fled had been the only survivor of the party. Obviously it had been a small band that had either left the fighting at the fort or was scouting ahead of the main body. Each moment that passed increased the chances for safety of the women and children hurrying toward Velitrium. Then, without warning, a shower of arrows whistled over his retreat. A wild howling rose from the woods along the trail. Either the survivor had gone after aid, or another party had joined the first. The burning cabin still smoldered, lending a little light. Then they were after him, gliding through the trees beside the trail. He shot three arrows and threw the bow away. As if sensing his plight, they came on, not yelling now, but in deadly silence except for a swift pad of many feet. He fiercely hugged the head of the great dog growling at his side, muttered, All right, boy, give him hell, and sprang to his feet, drawing his axe. Then the dark figures flooded over the breastworks and closed in a storm of flailing axes, stabbing knives, and ripping fangs. End of chapter 6